In this lecture, we're going to look at the history and legislation related to the emergence of Ohio as the 17th state of the United States in 1803. The first centers of white population began springing up in Ohio near major rivers, as you can see on this map. In part, this reflects the importance of waterways and travel. It also reflects the fact that parts of the state were still not safe for white settlers on their own. Cincinnati was the first Ohio city. It was founded in 1788 near Fort Washington. The original name was Los Santiville. After the Treaty of Greenville was signed in 1795, cities began to appear in many other places in the Ohio country. Chillicothe was founded in 1796. Its name is derived from the Shawnee word Chalakotha, which referred to both a division of the tribe and uh, also as a generic name for a political leader like chief. The etymology, though, of the word is somewhat unclear. Dayton and Cleveland were founded in 1796, while Steubenville and Athens were founded in 1797. The village of Franklinton named after Ben Franklin, was founded in 1798. This village would eventually become part of the city of Columbus. The image on this slide is of Newcomb Tavern in Dayton, named after a military official. This is the oldest building still standing in Dayton, and this two-story log cabin was also the site of Dayton's first court sessions, council meetings, and church services. The Northwest Territory was administered by a governor, a secretary, and three judges, all of whom were appointed by Congress. These five officials performed all of the executive, legislative, and judicial functions of government in the territory. They spent most of their time on horseback, uh, traveling around the region. The territory's first governor was Arthur St. Clair, depicted on this slide. He was a, a, a longtime associate of George Washington. Um, had been president of the Continental Congress in uh, 1786 and 7, and he was also the general behind the disastrous 1791 defeat of U.S. forces by Native Americans on the banks of the Wabash River. St. Clair and the territorial judges realized quickly that the region needed a working legal system until a more formal structure was developed. In 1795, they drew up a document known as the Laws of the Territory, of the United States northwest of the Ohio. This was commonly known as Maxwell's Code. The nickname is in reference to Cincinnati printer William Maxwell, depicted here on this slide, who printed copies of the laws. It was largely based on English common law, and the code drew also from laws on the books in such states as Pennsylvania, uh, Virginia, and Kentucky. By 1798, the population of the Old Northwest, or the Northwest Territory, exceeded 5,000 white males who met the minimum property qualifications to vote. This meant that the territory could enter the second phase of development, as spelled out, if you recall from the readings, in the 1787 Northwest Ordinance. The Territorial Assembly first met on September 24, 1799, in Cincinnati. The assembly was comprised of an upper house and a lower house. The Upper House consisted of five members of a legislative council appointed at that time by President John Adams, while the lower house contained 22 elected representatives. The first president of the assembly was Edward Tiffin, who you can see depicted here. Um, conflict quickly emerged, though, political conflict, as Governor St. Clair had absolute veto power over any assembly legislation. The image on this slide is of the young city of Cincinnati at the beginning of the 19th century. You can see it on the banks of the Ohio River. The new assembly established county courts and tax mechanisms for the territory. Property tax and licensing fees provided the first sources of revenue for the government. The assembly also enacted laws on personal behavior, um, such laws outlawing things like arson, which of course in an in a time and a place that was heavily wood-based, you can see why arson would merit the death penalty at the time. Uh, cursing, gambling, dueling, and drunkenness were among the, uh, the vices outlawed by the Territorial Assembly, although, of course, enforcing that's another matter. Highway ordinances were adopted that required all able-bodied men to work on road and bridge projects a certain number of days per year or face a fine 
I, I think the textbook says it's 75 cents per day, which doesn't sound like much, but back then that would probably be the equivalent of $20 a day or something. Slavery was outlawed in the territory. I should add, uh, this was not the result of any moral outrage over slavery or any abolitionist sentiment, uh, but rather that uh, politicians at the time believed that economic development would be hindered if free labor and a slave labor competed in the territory. The political factions that emerged in the territory and continuing into Ohio as a state reflected the same partisan developments at the federal level at the time. Arthur St. Clair was closely associated with the Federalists, uh, the party of uh, Washington and John Adams and Alexander Hamilton. Thomas Worthington, also depicted on this slide, was a major opponent of St. Clair and the Federalist. He was uh, one of the leaders of a group of politicians who aligned with the Democratic Republicans, whose national leader, if you know your U.S. history, was Thomas Jefferson. Here is another image later of Thomas Worthington. Uh, he was a leader in the statehood drive as well, the push for how to become a state. Um, in his political career, he served as Ohio senator from 1803 to 7, he was also the, if memory serves me correctly, the sixth governor of Ohio, uh, 1814 to 1818. You can look that up and see if I'm uh, accurate here. Um, he was a leading member of the Chillicothe Junto, a group of Democratic Republican politicians that also included his uh, brother-in-law, Edward Tiffin. Worthington pushed for numerous reforms, both in the Territorial Assembly and uh, um, as a state and national leader, including regulation of taverns, um, assistance to the poor, public education, and the development of a canal system for transportation needs. Thomas Worthington used his connections with President Thomas Jefferson to promote the idea of Ohio as a new state, as well as to get Arthur St. Clair ousted as governor in 1802. Um, the Enabling Act of 1802 authorized residents of the eastern portion of the Northwest Territory to form the state of Ohio, set the boundaries, the legal boundaries for the state. The act also set precedent and set procedures for the creation of future states in western territories, so it was uh, significant on several levels. Residents um, under the Enabling Act of 1802 elected a delegate for each 1,200 people to attend a constitutional convention. Again, this is a uh, free white males over 21 with property, so it wasn't truly a representative legislature, but for its time, uh, fairly democratic. Uh, the, re the Enabling Act and resultant statehood were strongly opposed by Arthur St. Clair and his faction. The Ohio Constitution was passed on November 29th of 1802. Um, it was fairly democratic for its time. Most of the power resided in the legislature, and the governor was largely a figurehead. In part, uh, this was a reaction to the perceived excesses and arrogance of Arthur St. Clair as territorial governor. But this also, uh, to be fair to St. Clair, uh, reflected national political trends. Uh, the legislature chose most state officers and appointed state and county judges. Um, slavery was outlawed as part of the Constitution, which sounds forward-looking. Um, but again, uh, this is uh, more to do with uh, economic considerations than any sort of uh, moral outrage over slavery. In fact, there's no evidence that any of the politicians were uh, significant abolitionists, at least, at least not at this time. Um, however, a motion to allow voting rights to African Americans failed. It was fairly close. Um, interestingly, um, Edward Tiffin cast the deciding vote against black suffrage. While he was uh, democratic in his political outlook, uh, Tiffin did not wish to extend democracy to free African Americans. Like many whites of the time, he believed that extending electoral rights to blacks would cause uh, something of a stampede across the Ohio River of blacks seeking freedom and full equality. The, the, uh, the notes related to the Ohio Con Constitution contain many references to this, be this belief of uh, the, the floodgates or something would open um, from Kentucky moving northward. Uh, and, and the vote was also restricted to, again, white male taxpayers over the age of 21. The official date for the statehood of Ohio is set at March 1st, 1803. 
This was the date that the new legislator first met in Chillicothe. The image on this slide, which is uh, the building slightly to the left of center, uh, is a replica of the first state capital at Chillicothe. So any Chillicotheans uh, listening in, you have your moment of pride because for a short period of time it was the state capital, among many that the uh, state has had. There was historically some dispute over the true date of statehood. Um, some argued that the real date should be February 19, 1803, which was the day that uh, President Jefferson signed the congressional legislation into law. Um, the controversy, as it stood, was uh, put to rest in 1902 when this uh, date that you see on the screen was accepted. On a related note, there's a, uh, there's a little bit of historical controversy over Ohio's statehood. Um, at the time, Congress did not issue uh, a separate non-binding resolution formally declaring statehood for Ohio, almost like a, a welcome to the neighborhood sort of resolution, as it did with uh, uh, Louisiana and Indiana. Now, again, this is a non-binding resolution. It's one of those things that politicians do that uh, um, has no um, effect of law. And there's a few conspiracy theorists, you can find them on the internet, who insist Ohio never officially became a state because of this non-binding res resolution. And all sorts of groups, um, such as tax evaders, I try to use this as an excuse um, to deny that a certain legislation, like in the in the case of the income tax, um, has any legality because they claim that Ohio was never really a state. Um, it's a it's a moot point and it's long been put to rest. And again, it's based on the fact of uh, uh, the lack of a non-binding resolution passed by Congress. This brings to a close our brief look at. Uh, the process of statehood for Ohio.